Stay hungry, stay foolish. What separates your mind from the mind of an animal? Maybe you think it's your ability to design tools, your sense of self, or your grasp of past and future, all traits that have helped us define ourselves as the preeminent species on Earth. But in recent decades, claims of human superiority have been eroded by a revolution in the study of animal cognition. Take the way octopuses use coconut shells as tools, or how elephants can classify humans by age, gender, and language. Take Ayumu, the young male chimpanzee at Kyoto University, who demonstrates his species' exceptional photographic memory. Based on research on a range of animals, including crows, dolphins, parrots, sheep, wasps, bats, whales, and of course chimpanzees and bonobos, our guest today explores the scope and depth of animal intelligence, revealing how we have grossly underestimated non-human brains. He overturns the view of animals as stimulus response beings and opens our eyes to their complex and intricate minds. With astonishing stories of animal cognition, his work challenges everything you thought you knew about animal and human intelligence. We welcome author of Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Franz de Waal, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be there. This show is brought to you by Microsoft for Startups. And don't forget to sign up for the Innovation Show newsletter to win books and courses every week. Although we consider ourselves top of the food chain and studies show we have more developed frontal cortices, it does not mean animals are dumb and terms like bird brain are all wrong. In fact, there is so much we can learn from animals. They are natural problem solvers. And to illustrate this, you open the book with the great story of Frangi. What happened with Franje, I worked at the time at a, at a large zoo in the Netherlands where they had a, uh, the world's largest colony of chimpanzees, 25 chimps on a big island. And um, when the weather got cold, the chimps would still go out, uh, but uh, they, they were clearly worried about the cold weather. And uh, Franje would, uh, one day she would collect all the straw from her night cage where she had been sleeping indoors and um, carry it with her outdoors, which is an indication that which normally they never, this happen, never happens, but she was doing that in the, in the cold time in November, uh, which indicates that she knew it was going to get cold that day and that she better had something to warm herself. And so that's, that's looking forward. And we, we do a lot of science nowadays on planning and uh, looking forward, looking backward uh, to what degree animals are capable of that. It's called time travel. And we have all sorts of indications that animals can do that, is that they can make plans. So, for example, in the wild, chimpanzees may collect grass stems at one place and then walk two miles with these grass stems in their mouth and then arrive at the termite hills where they use the, the grass to fish for termites, meaning that for a couple of hours before that time, they had already made plans to do this. So the planning capacities of apes and also some birds are now very well known. This is what really struck me was that people say animals don't prepare for the future, but rather they just react and live day to day. And Franje seemed to be preparing for the future. Yeah, but uh, we need to be careful. So, so the, the squirrels, for example, I'm not sure that the squirrels know about the winter that's coming and plan for the future because even a, a squirrel who has never seen a winter will collect nuts in the fall. So with squirrels, we think it is some sort of inborn tendency that is regulated by the weather and change of the season, so the light cycle. So the squirrels are triggered to hide nuts and they will use them in the spring or in, in the winter. But with uh, chimps and some other animals, we do experiments where, for example, we give them tools that they cannot use immediately. They have the choice between, let's say, a fruit that they can eat now, a tool that they can use now, and a tool that they can use tomorrow. They have learned that this tool is for tomorrow, for something big tomorrow. And then we see what they prefer. And, and chimps will prefer the tool for tomorrow. They will think that's a better deal for me. That also indicates that they're thinking ahead. So for the chimps and some birds, we have indications that they can think forward. You tell another great story, and I, I know I butchered the name Franje, but this one is Queef. 
Oh, yeah, Cliff, we call her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I got your name right, Franz. I got your name right. I'm not even sure what Cliff is in English. It's, it's, it's some uh, mohawk on your head or something. But anyway, uh, she also gave indications of thinking forward. She was an interesting case because we, she would have to come in several times a day from the, the colony lived outdoors on an island. She would have to come in several times a day to uh, bottle feed her baby because we had taught her how to bottle feed and she had a baby on her, but she would have to come in so that we could give her the bottle and she could feed her baby. And... Um, before she would do that, so she would be hanging around with everyone and grooming with the other chimps and having fights with them or whatever she did. But before she would come into the building, she would say goodbye to some of the chimps. She would go to the alpha male and say goodbye and, and kiss him. And she would go to her best friend, the mama, the alpha female, and say goodbye and kiss her. And she would do that to several individuals before she would come in. Uh, so saying goodbye is so interesting because we are so used to animals who say hello, like like your dog when you arrive home will say hello, of course. But how many animals say goodbye? How animal? How many animals think ahead like we do? We also say goodbye. We it's because we know we know of the separation and we know it may take a while before we see that individual again. You talked about this yourself, actually, uh, with with leaving to go to the states, for example, and leaving your mother and that type of thing. So it's that type of goodbye or what we all would have experienced. Yes, we've probably experienced the Mohawk as well during this COVID lockdown, but we've also had to say goodbye to some people. But I wanted to jump ahead to the concept of Umwelt mm -hmm. as a precursor to say there are lots of cognitive adaptations out there that we humans don't have or don't need. And this is why ranking cognition on a single dimension is a pointless exercise. Cognitive evolution is marked by peaks of specialization. I love this. And the ecology of each species is key. And to illustrate this, you provided the example of Gibbons and the out-of-reach banana test. Umwelt is a concept that comes from von Uxkuhl. I think it's a, that's at least a century ago. <laughs> I let you pronounce that, yeah. by the way. Did you notice that? <laughs> uh, uh, Jakob von Uxkuhl. And Umwelt means your surroundings. And, and he already said that every animal has its own way of looking at the world uh, because of the smells that they can smell, the hearing they have. For example, an elephant has a hundred times better smell than a dog, and a dog has it a hundred times better than us. So you can imagine what the elephant can smell compared to what we can smell. So, so the umwelt of the elephant is very different from ours because it consists of sounds and smells especially. So, so he had this concept, and, and we need to apply that every time we test an animal. We need to think about how does this animal perceive the world, and what can this animal do in the world. And that is sometimes very difficult for us. So, so an interesting test was with gibbons, which are primates, um, and, and they're actually very close to the apes. We are basically apes. We are like chimps and gorillas, and we are large, tailless primates. And the gibbon is also a tailless primate. And so the gibbons were tested on tools. They would put some food outside of the cage and, and give them sticks and, and see if they would use the sticks to reach the food as, as any normal ape would do. Uh, but the gibbons didn't do anything. And uh, that's where a scientist who knew gibbons very well, he decided to uh, put these little sticks on a sort of uh, elevation so that they were easier to grasp. The, the gibbon doesn't have a thumb. It's a, it's a, a tree-dwelling primate who never comes to the ground. He always hangs by his hands in the, in the trees and, and doesn't need a thumb. And so they have no thumbs. And it was impossible to pick up these sticks for the gibbon. And as soon as the, the scientists made it a little bit easier for them, they started doing it and they used tools like everybody else. And so that shows that you always need to adapt your test. And this is a very simple case. You need to adapt your tests to what the animals can do and will do and how they perceive things. With elephants, we had a similar situation because elephants were also tested on tools. For some reason, we think you have to use tools if you want to be smart because we, we, are, we humans are tool users and so we measure animals by our standards, basically. And so uh, elephants were tested on tools also in the same way with food outside of their cage, give them sticks, see if they use them, and the elephants didn't do anything. Now, it turns out that for the elephant, the organ that they would use is the trunk. And we, we think of the trunk as a sort of hand. 
but the trunk is actually a nose, of course. And so for the elephant to pick up something with the trunk means that he has to close off the nose. And when you, when you reach for food, that's maybe not the best thing to do. And so the elephant refused to do that. And, but when they set up a different test for them, where they hung food very high and gave them boxes, this was at the, at the zoo in Washington, they gave them boxes to stand on. And the boxes were far away. The elephant would go to the distant location to get these boxes, roll them to the place where the food was hung very high, and then stand on top of the box to reach the food, meaning that he was using a tool. So they were, very, they were capable of using tools, but it had to be the right tools under the right circumstances. This was really key for cognition in general. And th- this is the thing, and I absolutely highly recommend this book and you you're by the way your illustrations that you did yourself to write the book are, are beautifully done but i wanted to highlight a, a, a section from the book here you said faced with negative outcomes we need to pay close attention to differences in motivation and attention one cannot expect a great performance on a task that fails to arouse interest the reason i share this franz is as i read it I wondered about the great effort you and your colleagues put into these tests versus the generic one-size-fits-all tests we have for children for IQ, for example, or ADD or other neurodiverse skill sets. And it reminded me of a quote attributed to Einstein, which is, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think what happens with us is that we, we are very good at language and very good at tool use. That, that's the specialties of humans, I would say. And we're very proud of that. And so we think if an animal, if you want to judge an animal as being smart, you have to be good at that too. And so that's why we have done all these experiments with language teaching to apes. Uh, and we have done all these experiments with tool use because that's really what we think is so important. Now, but there's other capacities. Take, for example, echolocation of the bat. That's a very complex skill. Ask any engineer who designs a a radar system for an airplane how complex that is to to design a system like that for a flying object who, while flying, needs to orient in the world. It's it's extremely... uh, uh, And so the, the bat is cognitively very advanced, is a very smart animal, but in a way that we cannot relate to because echolocation doesn't mean much for us and we don't do much with it. And so uh, we always judge animals by our standards. And when they fall short, like in the ape language studies where they try to teach language to the apes, the apes were not doing so great. Uh, and if they fall short, uh, we say, look, we are the smartest. We always want to be the smartest anyway. In, in that regard, it's sort of interesting. The elephant is interesting because... There was a time, like five, six years ago, when people said, we're not going to look at the size of the brain of animals, we're just going to look at the number of neurons they have in the brain. And we're going to count the neurons. And and everyone was convinced that humans would come out on top, and so that was the way we're going to look at intelligence, comparative intelligence. Until a scientist did did this job on elephant brain, which is, by the way, three times larger than the human brain, and found that the elephant actually has uh, three times more neurons than we do. And that's where everything fell apart and where uh, they very quickly abandoned the whole scheme of counting neurons as a way of looking at intelligence. Because we we do want to be on top, and so if that doesn't work, then we find another way. I lived in the UK, and at the top of my street, I lived there for two years, there was a corner store, and it was owned by a Pakistani family. And... I probably went there about three times per week and every time they treated me like I was a stranger <laughs> and they recognized my Irish accent and they kind of go, oh, how's it going, mate? Have you just moved in? And I was like, I persevered for two years of this. And then the week I was leaving, I was like, kind of going, just, just wanted to say to you, you know, you know, I, I've, I've lived right like a few doors up here and I've come in here probably a hundred times in the last two years. And every time you ask me, have I just moved in? And he goes to me. All you Irish guys look the same to us. <laughs> and it, re- it reminded me when I was reading about facial recognition uh-huh. in, in animals, I was like blown away by what you have found. Yeah, so we, we humans, we have sometimes trouble recognizing faces of different groups, different ethnic groups. So that's what happened to you is that we're much better at the faces of our group than the other group. 
but this also happens to species. And so in, in chimpanzees and, and other primates, people had tested face recognition because we humans are very good at that, very quick. And so what you do is you present them on a computer screen and you see if they can match faces that are different photographs of the same individual. Do they match those? That, that's the way how we test uh, face recognition. And they had found that chimpanzees are very poor at it and, and, and that we humans are much better. And so the speculation was that human face recognition is, is a specialty, is, is a specially evolved characteristic. But, you know, they had tested the chimps on human faces. And when I asked these scientists who did their work, um, why did you test them on human faces? They said, well, human faces are so different one from the other that if they cannot do human faces, they can impossibly do their own faces. So, so they were so convinced that, that humans stood apart in that. And so when my student, Lisa Parr, started testing chimps on chimp faces, we had a lot of photographs of chimp faces. And so we did the same tests. They were all of a sudden just as good as humans. They, they, there was no difference. Uh, and so chimps are excellent at face recognition. It needs to be chimpanzee faces, not human faces. And for them, chimpanzee faces are probably be a lot more different than uh, human faces. This is a skill we thought was uniquely human, but you t told us further on in the book about paper wasps and how cognition depends on ecology, ecology being a branch of biology concerning interactions among organisms and their environment. There are a few wasps that live in small societies that have a hierarchy. I think you have alpha and beta and gamma individuals. And I think it's all females, but I'm not a wasp expert. And uh, they recognize each other. And you can test them on that. You, you can test them because all these faces have different patterns of yellow and black. And so they uh, recognize each other. They have very good face recognition too. And, and so that's a specialty that they need in their small scale societies. And so sometimes animals have a, a cognitive capacity that you may not expect, like in this case, face recognition, because they specifically need it. Moving on to something quite different, just about your field in general. So again, you, you, you say this with your tongue in cheek in the book that the autocorrect on many of our devices doesn't pick it up, ethology. <laughs> it's always going to ethnology. Yeah. But I found some really important lessons in your field of work. And one of them comes from one of the heroes of this show, which is Isaac Asimov. And Isaac Asimov, the science fiction novelist, said, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but, ah, oh, that's funny. And that's exactly what one of the founders of your profession, ethology, Nico Tinbergen, said when he noticed how stickleback fish reacted to passing red mail trucks. So I'm an etologist by training, so there's a big difference. Etology is a European specialty out of biology. These are biologists interested in natu natural or naturalistic animal behavior. The other category of scientists who does work on, on animal behavior are what we call behaviorists. They are more American and more psychologists. They're not the biologists. So they have less of an evolutionary perspective and they're more interested in what you can teach animals and how you can train animals and the learning capacities of animals, uh, such, such, such as the Skinner box, you know, pressing a lever to learn something. And so the ethologists have a more naturalistic approach. And Tinbergen, who later worked in Oxford, he, he worked most of his life in Oxford in the UK, uh, but he started his career in the Netherlands and uh, they had red mail trucks uh, at, the, at the time um, that would drive by uh, in the street. And he had his fish tanks in Leiden uh, looking, looking out on the street, basically. And he noticed that his fish would respond to the red mail truck. This was sort of ridiculous, of course. Uh, and um, but as it turns out, these sticklebacks, they have a red belly. The males have a red belly when they are in, cour in courtship. And um, they're very, very uh, alert to red bellies because they, they are rivals. They don't accept in their territory another male with a red belly. And so they're responding to the truck, the, the red male truck, uh, basically as if it was a, a competitor and reacting to it. And that's how, that's how Tinbergen got started with his study on the courtship displays of the stickleback. There's so much in there as well for human cognition. And this is what I found when you read your work it makes you look in the mirror and realize how many things we've overlooked in life, stuff staring us right in the face. And even, you know, human reactions, 
human evolution, like, for example, one of the things I heard when I read this, it made me think of is one of the reasons women wear red lipstick is because the human mind, the, particularly the male eye is tuned into red because it was either threat or it was berries. <laughs> Yeah, that's possible. You know, there's a speculation by there's a speculation by Desmond Morris. Uh, Desmond Morris wrote, wrote to Naked Ape, and he's also an ethologist. And he uh, speculated that um, we have moved a lot of signals that are genital signals or buttock signals to to the face. <laughs> and so for, for him, the red lips, <laughs> the red lips signify something else. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> which reminds me actually when you talked about when chimpanzees use mirrors, for example, very funny incident. You, you mentioned that female chimps will actually look at their buttocks in the mirror as well yeah. because they look for things that they don't normally see. Yeah, the, for the females, they're behind because in, in chimps and bonobos, the, the females have swollen genitals when they are fertile, which is a big signal for the males and the males are very attracted to that. And so for the female, her behind is a very important part of her body, and she will always look at that in the mirror. When you show a mirror to males, they don't look for their behind. Their behind is totally uninteresting, and um, <laughs> they're not. They're going to look inside their mouth or something like that. So they're, they're using it for something else. It's so fast. There's so many anecdotes like this in the book. But one thing I, I wanted to come back to, the difference between behaviorism and, and ethology, because I found many thoughts came to mind about how how the world has become for us because behavior is sought to dictate behavior by placing animals in barren environments in which they could do little else than what the experimenter wanted if they didn't their behavior was classified as misbehavior and this is exactly what i found what management often attempts to do with employees and oftentimes it's like put everybody in a room and make them innovate rather than put them in a room and create the right environment and let ideas and innovation emerge. I'd love if you'd expand on that from, from your perspective of how animals interact when they're left alone versus when they're kind of made to do things. Yeah, so the behaviorists, they're called behaviorists because they only believed in behavior. If you talked about, let's say, consciousness or feelings or thoughts, they would cringe. They, they didn't like these terms. They only liked what you could see in the actual behavior of the animal. And they would have very constrained environments, like the Skinner box with a lever on which the rat can press and get rewards. He couldn't do anything else. Rats are very social animals. They were alone in the Skinner box, so probably not very at ease because rats are more at, like the monkeys. They're more at ease when they're companions with them. And so they, they set up this very artificial situation. And as a result, for 100 years, they didn't find anything new. They, 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 they kept finding that animals are good at associative learning, which we all knew, uh, which is true. Um, but they have never found really anything spectacular, in my opinion. And so there's a big tension between the way the ethologists look at animals because they prefer naturalistic behavior uh, and uh, the way behaviorists do. And so behaviorists have created, I think, the wrong circumstances. So, so for example, testing an animal alone. Let me give you an example. I had a monkey lab for a long time, uh, capuchin monkeys. They, they lived outdoors in, in, a, in a social group most of the time, but sometimes we would call them in and they would come in and we do a, a test with them with a computer screen or something like that. And so these, but what I noticed very quickly is that if you test these monkeys alone, which is uh, desirable maybe because then they are not distracted by anybody, uh, they are very tense. They don't pay much attention. Uh, they, they are sort of nervous. And so it is much better to bring them in with a friend with, with, with their mother or with a relative or with a friend. Uh, and, and then you have two monkeys sitting there side by side. And they are much happier that way and they pay much, much better attention. And so we have done all our experiments that we did with these monkeys in situations where they could hear the group and where they had a, a companion present. And by testing animals alone, as many labs do, and many labs even go further than that, and many labs who test rats, they, they deprive them of food. They starve them. So they, they keep them, they, the way they put it in their scientific papers is, we kept the rats at 85% of their body weight, meaning these are very, very hungry rats 
who are supposed to perform a complex cognitive task maybe, but are completely focused on food, obviously. And so they set up situations that don't induce uh, interesting behavior, in my opinion, in animals. The animals are totally food focused. And each time I see this sentence uh, of we deprive the animals, um, I, I get very nervous by it. There's an interesting story on that in chimpanzees. The Yerkes Primate Center, where I work, exists already 100 years. And long ago, I think it's 50 years or 60 years ago, some behaviorists, some Skinnerians came to the primate center and wanted to test chimpanzees. And they had these very simple tests that are maybe good for rats, but are totally below the level of chimpanzees. And they wanted to starve the chimpanzees. And so they, they wanted to put them below their normal weight. And um, they tried to do that. But the animal care staff of the primate center did, did not agree with them and, and started feeding the animals at night. <laughs> it's sort of interesting. They, <laughs> they were subverting the whole experiment by feeding the chimps at night because they couldn't stand that these, these animals were kept in hunger. So the behaviorists had this, this idea in their head, which came from Skinner, is you need to starve animals and then you get the best kind of motivation for the tests that we do. But it, it all biases their results enormously, I would say. Harlow was more, Harry Harlow, the American primatologist, he was a, an early critic of the hunger reduction model, you say, and he argued that animals learn mostly through curiosity and free exploration, which is what I was getting at with the idea of an organization. An organization works best, there's a term called psychological safety, when it's in the exact same environment where people feel safe and free and it's okay yeah. to make mistakes and learn from mistakes. Yeah, Har Harlow, in, in his article where he was critical of, of Skinner and the behaviorists, he said, what do we do at the universities? The university is a, is a learning institution. Do we starve the students? No, of course we don't starve the students. <laughs> uh, and give them food rewards? I don't think the, the students would be learning very well, but we do that with all these animals. And, and so he was objecting to that because... Humans are, of course, most creative and absorb information the best when they are at ease, um, when they can explore things. For example, exploration, just looking around out of curiosity, is not driven by food usually. But um, th this was completely uh, beyond um, the scope of behaviorism. So you mentioned earlier on about testing animals on their own, and it made me think of what you talk about in here, a brilliant effect called the Kluger hands or the clever hands effect yeah clever hands um, has been used very often against the cognitive tests that we do nowadays we, we now have a, a generation of students of animal behavior who who uh, has abandoned behaviorism completely and is looking for cognitive characteristics in animals and 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 that's why every week we find something new that is really interesting uh, but for the longest time we were held back by Clever Hans. Clever Hans was a horse in Germany a, a century ago who could count. So, so you um, could, could uh, add up and could subtract and everything. You, you could say, uh, today it is July 31 and it is a Friday. Uh, what is August 10? What kind of day is August 10? And he would give the right day. Uh, or you could say uh, three times four, how much is that? And he, he would tap his hoof 12 times. And uh, people were astonished. And, and from far and wide, they came to see this horse, which was a magical horse, uh, until a psychologist, smart psychologist, said, well, I'm going to test the horse in a different way. I'm going to put a curtain between the owner and the horse. So the owner can still ask all these questions, but the horse cannot see the owner. And all of a sudden, Hans couldn't do anything anymore. Hans was making big errors. He couldn't do it. And so it was uh, the, the physical body language of the owner. The owner was not giving him the answers, but the owner was reacting to the answer. So if, if Hans, for example, needed to tap his hoof 12 times to give the right answer, the owner would probably shift his position or nod his head, unconsciously so. This was all unconscious. But the owner would react to these um, outcomes. And uh, so since that time, we know that you have to be very careful when you test animals. You have to be sure that we are not cueing them one way or another, even, even unconsciously. And uh, so Clever Hans is now always, was always brought up. If, as soon as 
people found something interesting, like let's say planning for the future in an animal, they would say, could it be a clever Hans effect? And so as a result, we, we very, as a result, very often we test animals without that we are present. We, we are maybe not present, or we have sunglasses on, or um, we, ha we have them work on a computer screen so they don't need to see us. Uh, so we, we, we have all sorts of ways of avoiding the clever Hans effect. Um, but uh, that was a very big deal at the time. One of the reasons I bring that up, Franz, is a couple of weeks ago we had Rob Fitzpatrick on. His book's called The Mom Test. And basically what it is about asking questions about your product or your innovation but essentially you're avoiding the clever hands effect. You're trying to avoid them telling you lies because they're trying to please you to get rid of you. So you stop asking their, their opinion. But um, I, I want to build on this because I, I, it made me think of, uh, do you remember Paul the Octopus, which was predicting the, uh -huh. the World Cup uh, results as well. But also, this you talk about this test when the mother, for example, or the father is present when the child's doing a cognitive test. That's a problem. Is People have been comparing, let's say, chimpanzees with children. I don't know why they always look for children, because an adult chimpanzee is really an adult chimpanzee, but we compare them with human children. And, and what they have done is, is they set up these tests where you, you show, for example, a child a puzzle box, uh, and uh, you show them how to open the box, and then you give the box to the child and see if they can do it. And, and so that's how you test, for example, imitation in a child. Uh, and what they found in these particular experiments is that children can do a lot of things that the apes cannot do. Uh, and, and this was always proudly reported in the most prominent journals because everyone is always happy to hear that we can do something that animals cannot do. But the chimps were tested by humans, by human experimenters, in exactly the same way as the children. Uh, the big difference is that um, the children are dealing with their own species. The chimpanzees are dealing with a different species. The children are being talked to. The chimps, maybe, maybe we talk to them, but they don't understand our language. The children sit on the lap of their mother. Um, the chimps are not sitting on the lap of anybody. The mother may be cueing them one way or another, even unconsciously. The chimps don't have that benefit. And so the tests are presented as identical tests that give different outcomes for chimps and children, but they're actually totally different tests. And, and the people have been complaining about this, this, this whole field of testing chimps by humans. Uh, and we, when we set up imitation experiments with the chimps, we did a chimp to chimp. We, we had a chimp who showed how to open a box and, and, and another chimp could then watch and then we would see how they would perform on the box. And what we found is that if a chimp see a chimp working, they pay a lot more attention they are a lot more in tune with another chimp, and, and they perform very well. And so the, all these tests where humans are the testers are problematic in some way. I'd love to build on that because you tell us later in the book about crows and the Aesop fable about filling the, the pitcher of water. And the reason I mention that is it's kind of the opposite, where chimps became very good at this test, but actually children, depending on their age, didn't do so well on it. Yeah, this was a test. Uh, it was a test where you had a, a vertical tube, and you put a peanut on, at the bottom of it, and so a, a chimp cannot get the peanut out because the fingers don't reach far enough into the tube, and they could also not shake the tube and things like that. And what they found is that some of the chimps, not all of them, but some of them, will walk to the water faucet and suck up a lot, a lot of water in their mouth and then go to the tube and spit the water into it so that the, the peanut floats up and they can grab it and take it out. Uh, it's, a very, uh, it's very interesting that chimps can do that because no one has been teaching that. It's certainly not based on learning. Um, they spontaneously find this solution. And when they present it to children, human children, the same problem in the same way, uh, there's only a small percentage of children that does this. And so um, the, the chimps, I believe, perform at the level of, of eight-year-old children, but for example, five-year-old children uh, don't, don't do this very well. And so this is one of these tests of insight, you know, uh, where animals think up a solution. Uh, and we have a lot of tests now, and including tests on, on birds. So, so it's not even limited to the apes. It's something that we can find in quite a few animals. It made me think of one of the 
blockers to innovation, which is this idea of functional fixedness. So a child might not see their mouth as a tool, or they certainly won't see water as a tool. But this is what you've shown through, again, observation, that animals will use tools that we don't think of necessarily as tools. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Water doesn't look like a tool, of course. Uh, on the other hand, a chimp who lives in uh, in captivity uh, in, in their in their home cage, they usually don't have a lot else than water and and straw and and a few other things. So so, so the the number of options that they have is very small compared to a child who lives in a home, for example. So uh, then then these these few things that they have, they become very important to them. And so all these things need to be taken into account when you compare the intelligence of children and apes. Mentioning that, again, that Asimov idea of, huh, that's interesting, those type of moments which happen so much in your field. You shared the eureka moment of German psychologist Wolfgang Kuhler and the chimpanzee. Kuhler. Kuhler, Kuhler, And the chimpanzee. Did I say it okay? (laughs) Yeah, Kuhler is interesting. Wolfgang Kuhler is interesting because he attacked the behaviorist. He was the first one to do so. so. So he had chimpanzees. He was a German psychologist. He had chimpanzees and he decided not to train them at all, but to give them um, sticks and boxes and put a banana very high and then see what they would do. And and the chimps would not not do anything. They they would actually, some of the chimps would try to have him do the job. They would would take his hand and lead him to the, to where the banana was and and, uh, see if he could get it. (laughs) (laughs) So they were using him as a tool. Um, But uh, but the chimps would sit around and stare at the thing and not do anything. And then after half an hour or whatever, one of his chimps would jump up and, and grab the boxes and stack them and grab the stick and reach the banana. And he, he called that an insight. The chimp had an insight. It had a sudden flash of thinking and had solved the problem in his head. Now, the behaviorists, they were... They, they, they're still behaviorists today who cannot pronounce the name of Kohler. They become all spastic about it <laughs> because Kohler was, Kohler was the first one to say animals can actually think. They can solve a problem in their head. And now we have all these pieces of evidence for that. But he was the first one to do so. And so he's actually the pioneer, I would say, of animal cognition. One of the things I wanted to draw out of Kohler was how he said learning involved committing a ton of what he called stupidities and that showed that solutions kind of were carved out of the mistakes that we make which is so important and it's so important in learning for humans as well and we don't we allow children to make mistakes of course when they fall etc cetera, etc cetera. but as we grow older and as the world is changing as rapidly as it is today we need to have more tolerance for stupidities in organizations in order for people to learn but do we actually allow children to make mistakes? I, I see all these playgrounds where they put soft tiles at the bottom so that when a child falls out of the climbing frame, she, she or he falls on some sort of soft surface. Yeah. I was never treated that way. We, we would climb into the stupidest things and get out, get out and fall and uh, open ourselves and be bleeding and whatever. <laughs> and that's how you learn, actually, that you should be careful not to fall out of the thing. And the kids nowadays are so protected by the parents and by the environment that I'm not sure they're learning the right things this way. I agree. And, and it's one of the reasons when you read something that's beyond your field, like I did with this book, and I got so much out of it, so many analogies, so many new neurons were firing and connecting, etc. But I wanted to build on this idea of of learning. And you tell us here, and, and I haven't heard this beautiful definition of cognition. Cognition, you say, relates to the kind of information an organism gathers and how it processes and applies this information. You continue and you say, without any reward or punishment, animals accumulate knowledge that will come in handy in the future, from finding nuts in the spring to returning to one's burrow to reaching a banana. The role of learning is obvious, but what is special about cognition is that it puts learning in its proper place. Learning is a mere tool. It allows animals to collect information in a world that, like the internet, contains a staggering amount of it. 
it is easy to draw in the information swamp. An organism's cognition narrows down to information flow and makes it learn those specific contingencies that it needs to know given its natural history. That's a huge statement and and, and I was totally struck by this because in this world where mm -hmm. we're being overwhelmed with information, we have a huge amount of information coming down the line and I often wonder how that's going to affect us. And I'd love, I'd, uh, that's not really a question. It's more of a, a thought I'm sure you've had yourself. Yeah, um, it's because we have all these theories about animal intelligence, which are all focused on how they are capable of maximizing rewards, let's say, and, and avoiding punishment. Uh, all this focus on, on uh, reward and punishment uh, also as expressed by the behaviorists, also ex as expressed by starving the animals before the test so that they're highly motivated to get rewards and things like that. I, I, it's a very interesting book. Um, you know the Planet of the Apes. You know the movies, I'm sure. Uh, but but I recently reread the, the original book uh, of Planet of the Apes, which which is actually more interesting, I would say, than the movies. And in that book, humans land on a on a planet where the apes are in control and the, the humans end up in a cage and are being trained with sugar cubes by the apes to perform certain tasks. And each time the humans do something very smart, like stacking boxes to reach uh, food, for example, because they, they repeat the Kohler experiment on them, each time the humans do something smart, uh, the scientists are very skeptical. Like like real scientists, they are, oh, may, maybe, maybe they're... They don't fully understand the task, but they, by accident, they performed well and stuff. They try to minimize what the humans are doing because humans are obviously very stupid creatures. And so uh, th that was very interesting to see reflections on human intelligence made by apes in this case that were very similar to what I'm used to as the criticism of, of animal cognition. And building on that back and forth between humans and animals, we talked about facial recognition and how animals have an unbelievable eye for human faces. And you mentioned the, the crow experiment, for example, but I'd love if you expand on that in a second. But the reason I mentioned that is I thought about this situation we're in, this global pandemic and how people are wearing masks, right? And I thought that I wonder how that's going to affect children because, and this is one of the things about the evolutionary part, if a child is born into a situation in a hospital or perhaps is around people wearing masks all the time. I often wonder, how is that going to play out? I don't know how long we're going to have to wear masks until we find a cure, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a huge implication of this on, on behavior, whether it's animal or human. Yeah, it, it, it of course interferes with uh, face recognition. It, it, it already interferes with the face recognition software that we have. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, that's maybe a good thing in some ways. Uh, uh, the, the mask really prevents face recognition. Let me tell you an interesting story on this. I, there was a chimpanzee female named uh, Lolita who I knew very, very well and uh, who left um, the place where I worked um, uh, and, and ended up in a very different uh, location. And when I visited that other institution, that was 25 years later, and I heard that Lolita was living there I said, well, I, I need to visit her. And so uh, I went to uh, the area where she lived, a sort of outdoor enclosure. And I stood there and she absolutely did not respond to me. Uh, I had a mask on because everyone, this was a medical institution, everyone had a mask on. And so uh, she, she clearly didn't recognize me. But when I, I, I said her name a few times, she immediately rushed forward, and, and so after 25 years, she recognized me by my voice. That was really interesting to me, is that my eyes alone did not trigger the recognition, but my voice did. It's interesting, actually, because I heard that in hospitals now, you know, when somebody's going through an operation, etc., at the moment during the pandemic, doctors are obviously kitted up. They look like space aliens with the amount of safety equipment they're wearing, but they've started putting pictures of themselves on their chest so if the patient wakes up 
during, uh, you know, they, they, they don't, they're disorientated, they don't know where they are, at least they'll recognize, oh, that's my doctor, etc. So it's so baked into evolution that we need to recognize faces. But it's interesting you mentioned about Lolita there, because you mentioned about Marsloof's Angry Birds experiment about the crows. Yeah, the, the, the crows apparently, this was at, on a campus on the, on the West Coast, the, the crows were sometimes captured by scientists uh, and then banded, I suppose, and released again. And uh, the scientists who did the capturing were recognized by them. And so th- these people, they, they could not even walk over, uh, around on the campus because all the crows would start yelling at them, uh, the crows in, in the area. And apparently the, the, the knowledge was transmitted to other crows because now even crows who had never been captured also started yelling at them when they saw them. And so they could not really walk around, and uh, they started t- test. They started testing this out with Halloween masks. So instead of showing their real face when they captured them, they would show them a mask of Dick Cheney or something like that. And uh, and and that's how they they tested out if the crows could recognize. But the crows, the crows had a very good face recognition. Yeah, as you say in the book, there there was more of a reaction from the students with the Dick Cheney mask than there was from the birds. <laughs> Yeah, the students <laughs> recognized Dick Cheney too, from, but they had different different reasons. <laughs> so I, wa- I wanted to, talk to, in your great field of ethology, there's a great language, and some of this language is so useful for innovation in business. And I loved your thoughts on homology, analogy, and convergent evolution. I'd love if you shared these, what they mean, and perhaps some examples of both. Let me start by analogy. Analogy is when things are similar, evolved in a similar way, but they're not related to each other. So, for example, the shape of a dolphin and the shape of a fish are very similar. Not because a dolphin derives from a fish, because a dolphin actually derives from land mammals. Uh, so, so, So it is an independent evolution which has come about because the dolphin and the fish live in the same environment. So they have the same streamlined bodies that you need to swim in the ocean. So that's called an analogy or convergent evolution, independently evolved. Homology is when things are related uh, and for that reason they are similar. So so homology, for example, my hand and the hand of a chimpanzee are almost identical uh, because they are homologous. My hand is also very similar to, let's say, the wing of a bat. In the wing of the bat are the same bones as in my hand because they are homologous structures, even though the function of my hand is quite different from the wing of a bat. And so homology is when things are similar because they are related to each other. Uh, And, for example, the facial expressions of humans are homologous with those of the primates. The the chimpanzee has many muscles in the face, just like we do, and can make many different expressions and makes them under similar circumstances as us, emotional circumstances and so the facial expressions of the human and of the chimpanzee are homologous one of the things i just wanted to share on this was it's great way of thinking because the, your 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 book and your work and I've, the age of empathy as well i've read and, and i'm, I'm going to read your other books as well but i found that it's paradigm shifting so it, it helps us think differently and business and innovation is homologous. So we we tend to copy what went there before us, or we tend to copy people in our own field. But because the of digital and because of the internet, the walls between businesses are breaking down. So we need to think more analogous and actually look for similarities, best principles from other other fields of learning, rather than actually just following in in a in a incremental pathway. I, I want to come back to something you talk about because you you dedicate a lot of time to tools and the tool usage is fascinating by animals and i found the use of tools toolkits in particular really fascinating but more important than that the logic behind tool use for example chimps fishing for termites with toolkits of sticks just like gibbons do when they hunt honey and how chimpanzees crack nuts with carefully selected stole stones and like you said earlier we tend to treat all chimps the same, but it takes a child chimp longer to learn how that skill of cracking nuts than it does. But it was the logic behind them that I thought was fascinating. Because if they crack nuts, for example, 
the nutritional value or the energy energetic value from those versus chewing on leaves all day is much higher and therefore it's worth the effort yeah the way young chimps learn to crack nuts is sort of interesting because it shows why all this focus on reward and punishment is not really useful because a a young chimp will sit next to its mom uh, mother is is cracking nuts with stones. She has an anvil stone and a hammer stone, and she puts very tough nuts that you cannot crack otherwise, uh, and then uh, hit them with with the hammer stone. And um, the young chimp will start mimicking her movements. He will also collect stones and put them in the right position and and collect nuts and bang them together. And for the first couple of years, I think at least three or four years. Uh, the young chimp is not capable of cracking anything because it takes an enormous amount of force and coordination, and they they don't have that. And so there's a very long learning time where these young chimps are incapable of getting the rewards out of the behavior. So it's an unrewarded behavior that they're showing while sitting next to mom doing exactly what she does, but not as efficient as she does. So that shows already that exploration and curiosity and trying to figure things out are what comes first, and the rewards of the behavior, in this case, eating nuts, uh, is something that comes often uh, years later. The toolkits that were used were fascinating as well. So they didn't, the chimpanzees didn't come with just one stick, one tool to do the job. They had multiple tools to do multiple jobs. It was like they they were a tradesman or tradeswoman coming to do a job in a house. Yeah, there are chimps in Africa that uh, hunt for uh, underground ants, and, and in order to reach those ants, they come usually with two sticks. One is, one is a stick that they drive into the ground to make a big hole uh, to reach the ants. And then the other stick is, is much more slender that they descend into the hole to catch the ants and to pull them up. And so they come with two sticks, two different sticks with, for different purposes. And, and I've heard that, that chimps who hunt for beehives they come even with more tools. Um, they they need more than than one kind of than two kind of tools, and so they come with three or four of them. One final question, I thought, Franz, to bring it all together was: you've studied evolution essentially, and and the behavior of animals through observation, etc. And I often wonder where where we're headed from an evolutionary perspective as a race as well. So. For example, we've adapted, so from my reading of Richard Rangham's work, for example, we adapted once we discovered fire. Fire was our first technology, and it made us, it, we actually changed physically as a result of that new technology. Now we're on the cusp of merging and converging technologies, 5G and all these things, the amount of data that we're going to consume, for example. But we're also concurrently outsourcing more of our thinking, our cognition to machines. There's a term called digital dementia, which is where I will, tools like, for example, remembering a phone number in the past. I don't need to do that anymore. So my brain's going to change. And I, and I just wonder. Yeah, we don't, we, we don't need to navigate anymore. We have machines doing that for us now. Yeah. And, and, and for example, there's, there's a famous taxi driver study that showed that taxi drivers in the UK and London, it's a very complex route of, of roads, etc. So their brains, their hippocampus has actually evolved differently. It's more activated differently. So I'd love, just as a parting kind of thought, what are your thoughts for the future in this world of rapid change from a technological perspective? Yeah, I'm not sure we, we humans are still evolving in the sense that we are genetically changing, because that's what evolution would mean. Because genetic change of the human species would only happen if there is, um, is there pressure, if there are evolutionary pressures on us. Now, there are a few, I think, certainly in, in the domain of immunology, especially now that we have the virus crisis, you're going to have people who die. Uh, and so there's a selective pressure. Uh, and, and I think that that has happened with Ebola also in Africa, is that there are certain people who survive and who carry on, and others who die, and and so, in the in the domain of immunology, yes, we I think we are still evolving. Uh, there's other things where we have removed the pressure. So, for example, if you have poor eyesight, in the old days you would maybe walk into a lion, which was not a good thing. Uh, nowadays we have glasses on, and so we will see the lion and be able to avoid him. And so, uh, 
Yeah, so, so we have removed the pressure uh, by, by certain measures that is certainly me medical, medical advances and, and, and solutions like hearing aids and, 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 and glasses and so on. So uh, evolution requires pressures, uh, selective pressures. And uh, I'm not sure we, we have them. And uh, so I'm not sure we will get dumber because we have all these smartphones nowadays. I'm not convinced of that. If there was a parting message that you wanted to leave from your work, in case we don't, I'd love to have you back on the show and talk about The Age of Empathy is such a beautiful book and probably more relevant than it ever was before. I highly recommended, particularly in these times of polarized society. But a parting message for our audience from your field for humanity? Well, to say it in very general terms, I, I think in my books on animal intelligence and animal emotions, what strikes me is that human philosophy, Western philosophy especially, has a major flaw. And the flaw is that it has always emphasized how humans are special. It has always emphasized human exceptionalism. We are so different. We are so superior. And this is something that now in the crisis with the virus and in the climate crisis that we have and the extinction of lots of species in the world, we are seeing how this is coming back to bite us. The idea that we are different, that we are separate from nature, which also means we can do anything we want. We, we can eat a bat and it will be fine. We can destroy the ocean, it will be fine. We humans are the boss of the world, basically. And this whole attitude that is present in Western philosophy and Western religion, of course, is, is now coming back to bite us. And, and we need a totally different way of thinking about ourselves and our environment. Is We are animals. We are not particularly different from other animals. We live in the same sort of global environment. We have to be careful with that environment and more respectful. And this whole emphasis on humans as unique and special and different and superior... I think it's a flaw of Western philosophy. I often discuss things with philosophers, and of course, there are many different opinions. There are many philosophers who are on the side of biology and neuroscience and so on and understand it. But there's also many philosophers who act as if, still act as if humans are not animals, which I think is really problematic. Beautiful message. And Franz, for people who want to find out more about you and your work and your books, where can they find you? My books are available. I think there's at least a dozen books and I also have a Facebook site with 600,000 followers. And so I often feature animal behavior there. I'll link to that in the show notes. And a reminder that this show is brought to you by Microsoft for Startups. Author of Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Franz De Waal, thank you for joining us. You're welcome.